thank you very much and to uh, come and uh, listen to me and talk about the uh, Sino-US relations and also some of the potentials and uh, downstreams for these two greatest countries and the greatest people. <coughs> and uh, I feel so much honored and uh, probably this is the first time I speak in front of you know, so much uh, prestigious uh, group of uh, uh, audience and uh, make me really nervous and uh, <laughs> I hope uh, you're all good people <laughs> uh, or pass over. I, I believe you know very very decent and the same as uh, as me you know. thank you <laughs> well uh, and uh, I thought about you know what should I talk and uh, just uh, just now I talked very briefly with uh, Helmi and uh, probably I use uh, 10 to 15 minutes uh, to cover the recent development of our two countries about the relations and I think uh, most of you are really fully aware of that and uh, so I touch a little bit and then I will touch a little bit about the uh, 12 to 5 years plan which is very very important uh, you know short term midterm mixed development plan for China covering almost every aspect not only economic but social, political, culture, everything. And but I'm gonna focus on the economic. And if you folks interesting to deepen some of the uh, aspects and you may raise questions. So I leave about uh, twenty five to thirty minutes for Q and A. The reason why I try to leave more time for Q and A, I I want to get your questions. And he said, for well, just listen to me to talk, you know, talk about here. And uh, so I would uh, like to invite you any questions, any concern that you might in mind, and, uh, <coughs> please. And talking about the bilateral relations, everybody thinks today, no matter friends, even enemy, you know, unfriendly people also agree these bilateral relations between U.S. and China, China and U.S., is one of the most important bilateral relations in the world today. And uh, it's absolutely agree or not, this is the fact. And that's why our President Hu Jintao made the state visit, and which is the only state visit invited by President Obama for this year for the U.S. and uh, result really strategic and historical and remarkable result of President Hu Jintao's visit in D.C. early uh, uh, mid-January, which is we're gonna, we're gonna build up together a mutual respectful and mutual beneficiary strategic cooperative partnership downstreams <clears throat> and this is truly the common goal we should reach because if these two largest nation and uh, really work together as a partnership with a mutual respect and a mutual benefit and we believe that it will contribute a lot to the world to every economy every country on this earth and I think this is the fundamental relation and policies between our two countries and uh, so this is remarkable result. <clears throat> of course, before we have been working together, you know, on cooperative collaborations and many aspects, and uh, these two countries never have been working so closely on so many exchanges and so many global issues. And uh, so we believe that China's development will really enhance 
this relationship. Of course, we got controversy thing, I understandings and about things about this uh, society, about everything, maybe. But it doesn't matter for us to work on some of the common interests. We share a lot of common interests, same as with other countries too. Okay. For instance, recently, our president signed a very, very important understandings among the countries of the BRIC, the BRIC country. If you read the details of the agreement, that's very, very broad and wide, wide uh, covering almost every aspect about the concerns of every country in the world today. So I think these two countries, U.S. and China, China and U.S., will work more closely in the next 5, 10, 20, and downstream years. <clears throat> and because we both work for our next generations and next, next generations, it's not short sight. It's a long term. Uh, strategy for both of us. And uh, let me cover some, because time limitation, so I would not, you know, uh, expand on this. About the uh, 12th five-year plan recently, last month, uh, promulgated by the uh, People's Congress. And this five-year plan represents a very healthy strategic planning for the development of China in the next five years. There are three major concerns, all the major uh, objects that we'll get, we're going to uh, reach. First of all is to continuously bring up the people's living standard almost on every aspect. Social welfare, Medicare, education, housing, everything. And also, with this plan, we're going to cover the equality of the whole society, especially focusing on the low-income crowd of the people and especially focusing on the Midwest and West of China, which relatively less developed than the Eastern Coastal Area. And this is actually the continuation of last five or eight years' efforts to boom the development of the Midwest and also the even further the Western region of China. And we have already witnessed big change. And that's why currently you probably recognize the price increase on food products, on meat. And from my perspective, I understand it's not a simple inflation. It's just the demand and supply. Why? Average family poor family have increased their incomes and improved their capability to consume some of the high value, high value products like meat. In most of the West regions and most of the family, especially those poor ones, before a few years ago could only have pork or other meat once a week or once a month. Now they can afford probably twice a week, three times a week, or every day. That's enormous demand. And the market could not react. Although China already adopted the market economy for 30 some years, 
but still the mechanism and the flow of the goods and the reaction of the investors is not there yet. <clears throat> All not fully there yet. Okay. For instance, the hogs, pig farm. When the demand is there, you need a kind of circulation and a delay of the investment and products coming up. For instance, Guizhou province, four or five years ago, they were export their pork to other provinces. <clears throat> four years ago, they got a shortage on their market, on their own. A village could slot one hog a week, and now they got to slot 10 of them. And for the villagers, demands. So that's not only the inflation, it's the supply and demand. So that's my perspective. So the 12 years, the 12 five years plan is going to continue these efforts. And this is going to be very, very important for the development of the domestic consumption, which the Chinese government spent a lot of efforts to create the volume of the domestic market. So that's why we now experience probably the first time in the last 20 years, the first quarter international trade is showing a deficit for China. I'm talking about overall. And yesterday I met the representative from Governor Schneider of Michigan. And I told her last year Michigan exports to China increased by 96%. 96% almost double in a single year. So that's really potentials, and it really means something. When China says we want to bring you know, up the average people's living standard, it create the market, create the production, create the flow of the merchandise, and create the needs of the people. And uh, so this is very, very important. And secondly, is working on the upgrade of the industries. They should calculate carefully about their own capability and their own potential. Doesn't mean every city can be a service-oriented city. Some of the cities, yes. Beijing, Shanghai, you know, Canton maybe and Jiangsu, some of the cities here, they can. But other cities got to be industrial. So industrialization is still going on in China. And also, the same time, we need to work on the upgrade of the industries. So you will witness in the next five years a lot of shiftings. Shifting of businesses, shifting of manufacture, and I think inflation also helped China to fulfill this task because inflation will create the wage increase. And wage increase will allow more value-added products to be produced. The labor, higher labor, will move out some of the low-end products after everything. And uh, because other economies need some preparations too, to get the capability and capacity of manufacturers. <clears throat> so within the, with the second task, we will witness a lot of changes, lots of changes. And third is the echo all environmental friendly, sustainable economy. <clears throat> so China is going to work 
more focusedly on the sustainability of the economy. And in the last 30, 40 years development, we have learned a lot of lessons, especially on the massive development. You actually lose some of the control of the resource consumption, of the environment control, water, air, whatever related. So in the next five years, China is going to be focusing on clean energy, a more friendly, environment-friendly industries, and more careful investment, and uh, create less problem for the environment. So in this respect, U.S. and China will share a lot of, a lot of business opportunities. Same with Europe, same with other nations. Because China is big, it's huge, but doesn't mean that China can do everything. I don't think any country can do everything themselves. That's why we have the globalization, and we share the benefit of the globalization. So China is very much international trade, free trade, pro-country. And the result of the international trade balance really shoots it. And uh, so these three forces, to me, from my perspective, are the most important thing to China, to almost every family of China, and also to every economy <coughs> of the world. Because only last year, China contributed 20% of the global economic growth. And also this upgrade of the economy performance will create lots of business opportunities, especially for U.S. and other technology advanced countries. China needs technology. Because with such a short time, China could not develop all this technology on our own. Although we have invested a lot, education is going to be a focusing. And they are talking about 4% of GDP to be invested on education. And quite a few of the provinces or municipalities already meet that goal. Shanghai already did. Beijing already did. And uh, other provinces are coming up. And uh, internet, uh, at the <coughs> on the education investment is both the efforts of the central government and also the local government as joint efforts, like here, the federal, state, and city, same, and private sectors too. And there are quite many private colleges, institutes and even universities now in China. So I believe this upgrade also uh, could, sh could see about the economic growth target. In the last five years, China almost developed with two digit increase. Last year we did 10.2%. And for the next five years, we targeted at seven and a half percent. Lower down the growth, but more healthier. And more investment will be going to the infrastructure and cultural, uh, 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 agriculture related and industrial upgrade related, and also on the transportation systems. And, and networking, and also uh, education on uh, scientists and technology developments too. And science and technology development, we targeted a 3% <coughs> investment of the GDP, enormous efforts. And all this will create enormous business for the world, and so to help the world economy. Well, I think uh, spend 
a little bit more and uh, leave the rest of the time for your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. So any questions? Please. Well, and, uh, thank you, Council Yan, for a very informative presentation. You didn't seem nervous at all to me. <laughs> um, it looks like a very interesting ensuing five years. Um, but I wonder, the uh, BRIC Confederation and are competing somewhat with the U.S. in attaining oil assets. Do you feel that um, there's a way that the two entities could cooperate in the search and acquisition of oil instead of competing, which drives the price up? Yeah, <coughs> Richard, you really you brought up uh, quite an interesting question, and uh, actually we both concerned very much about the energy, especially the natural, uh, <coughs> for the, the fossil uh, fuel and, and the fossil uh, uh, energies. Because of the enormous economic development really creates enormous demand on the consumption of the oil. And the, uh, so I believe these two countries, it's not a matter of whether or it's a matter of must. We have to. We have to work together. Even not only between our two countries. I think the world needs to work together. Look at the gas price here. Look at the increase of the gas price in China <coughs> created so much problems. It's not a simple matter of price, commodities price. It's a matter of uh, stability of the social, of the society. People could not afford it. People could not afford it because the whole system, economic system, could not respond. The people's income could not follow it. But at the same time, our technology is not that well developed yet. It's not ready. So we have to work together on the natural resources, on the energy issues. And we have to. And I believe these two countries going to work more closely on how to make more efficient, more effective, more clean, and more sustainable energy and create the policies. Not the policies dealing with each other only, but the policies to handle the interest from the United States. And the agricultural products, not only the, uh, the, meat, the, the, the meat products, but also the feeding materials and, and the corn, wheat, and uh, Soybean, we, we're buying a lot. And talking about the investment, truly, yes. And I've been talking probably every speech and to say food processing is a very, very good potential for Midwest. And the many investors will come. And I think the result of President Hu's visit, one of that, is that Chicago, Midwest has been more known by the Chinese business communities and potential in, uh, investors. And remember, attached with the official delegation, we got 500 entrepreneurs into Chicago. Had a wonderful forum. I guess many of you were there. Thank you very much. For sure, very positive. Yes. Sure, please. Yes. Um I wanted to thank you for being here today, and I wanted to thank uh, Niagara Foundation for a very fortuitous uh, meeting this morning. I, I don't know how many of you realize this, but this morning, <clears throat> literally as we speak, um, the Asian Society is releasing a, a close to 100-page report on wow. Chinese foreign direct investment. Uh, they estimate that over the next decade, $2 trillion is going to go in foreign direct investment out of China. Not equity investing, not buying bonds, but good old-fashioned companies. And the perspective was the U.S.'s, and <coughs> it talks about all the controversies and some of the 
corporate issues. Um, expanding on the question that was just asked, uh, if you could continue on that theme, um, almost as, a, as suggestions or guideposts, um, if we can talk about the big picture political stuff, but we're here in Illinois. What can be done, practically speaking, uh, to make sure that Illinois, I mean, you know, U.S. is a big country, we could talk about Illinois, benefits <coughs> from, from those flows? Uh, I believe uh, Illinois need uh, to work as the Mayor Daly's, uh, you know, energy, inspiration, you know, in six months, he made the two trips to China, focusing on business, focusing on education exchange, focusing on culture, focusing on the relations. And uh, I know Governor Pat Quinn is preparing to take a trip probably in September, October to China. And uh, many other governors from the city, states around are preparing their trips to China. And China truly were invest and determined to invest in abroad. Why? Because we have already benefited in the last 30 some years to attract foreign investment into China, which helped China a lot. Not only production, not only manufacturing and technology wise, but also management. Look at the management skills has been improved so much. And China's average GDP per capita last year reached 4,000 US dollars. And most of the areas in the East Coast area already passed 6,000 US. And because once you, once the economy passed over 6,000 US dollars, you got excess money to invest in abroad. So China has reached a point, truly yes, exactly as what you said. China's investment in this respect is going to be very much focusing on manufacturing. Illinois got a real, real good development foundation. You got the most skillful work, workmanship, labor, and engineering, and technology. And you got so much capability on education. You got the best schools here. And R&D centers. I don't know how many. I have been some of them. Very, very impressive. And all this will help these two countries to uh, work together. So I believe more investors will come. And uh, if we gave very friendly uh, 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 environment to them. I talked to quite a few mem uh, mayors around Chicago and Illinois, and also talked in S Springfield to the senators and the House of Representatives. And I believe we do have the environment here. So we investors, can. if you are invest in the manufacturers, this is the most ideal place. Thank you. You mentioned HSR, and that's one of Mayor Daly's kind of big projects right now, especially yes. after his recent trip to China. Can you talk about high-speed rail in China, some of the challenges, some of those successes? Yes. Uh, with China, in the last uh, seven, I, sh I think should be around eight years, uh, <clears throat> 10 to eight years. And China has been focusing on development of the HR, HSR system. And uh, we learned a lot from the worldwide technology. And, and, and uh, it's a public. And on the Chinese technology, we have developed over 10 corn technologies and, and the, uh, the, the intellectual property corn technology to upgrade the HSR system. 
So the HR, HSR system running now in China is truly the innovation of Chinese effort, Chinese efforts on innovation. And this technology, I think, is very, very suitable to the flat, to the flat environment, land. So to the Midwest, it's very, very important. Because with that technology, the climbing percentage angle is about a one to one and a half percent. And also make curve, because it's such a high speed and it's a real system, and running by the, real, the wheels, and these big curves. And Midwest got a vast and plan and low level land. So connecting all these big cities is very, very suitable for that technology. And the speed, can, now we know it's quite safely can reach over 200 miles. And with this system, the benefit is that along the line, the urbanization will be reshaped. Property will be recalculated. Look at the result between Shanghai, Beijing, and Hangzhou. Hangzhou, 10 years ago, their property price, I'm talking about homes, probably is about 70% of Shanghai. Now, they are number one in the country most expensive, surpass Shanghai and Beijing. They are challenging, Shanghai, challenging Hong Kong. Why? Because the traveling distance. So it's not a matter of distance now. It's a matter of timing, a <clears throat> matter of time. Between Shanghai and Hangzhou is 268 kilometers. And with this distance, now you spend less than 30 minutes to reach. No, excuse me. Less than 30 minutes reached by the maglev. And with the high-speed reel, it's about 37, 38 minutes precisely. So the line itself, talk, people talk about the expense. It's too expensive. The line itself were never pay off itself, or never. But the economic result were far, were far over the investment, even in the short term, in the sense of the short term. And now in China, about 5,000 miles of HR, HR are in operation. And in the next two to three years, the same mileage will be in operation. I'm not talking about construction. I'm talking about in operation. Now from Wuhan to Guangzhou, you can travel by HSR. Between Wuhan and, Hangzhou, uh, and Guangzhou, before you need to travel about 20 hours. Now it's a matter of uh, five hours. Enormous. And in June, Shanghai and Beijing will be connected. And between Shanghai and Beijing, it's about a four and a half hours. By airplane, in air time, it's one hour and 40 minutes. And uh, taxing, checking, waiting, and commuting, or, you know, at least four and five hours. But this is town to town, the, the, the downtown to downtown system. It's very, very inspiring. And I think uh, you guys need that. And it's very environmental friendly. Nobody touching the, or less people, few people touch the pollution of the air traffic. Actually, air traffic pollute the most.
of our air. Just the taking off 747 would consume at least a 10 and a half, one and a half tons of fuel, believe it or not. That's why air ticket is so expensive. Thank you. Let's get to the last question. Yeah, please. Um, when the Chinese financial authorities agreed to float their currency, I think many Americans had very unrealistic expectations as to what to expect among the exchange rates. I'm just curious, how do Chinese financial authorities look at setting the exchange rate in the future? What's reasonable to expect there? Well, I... <laughs> I've talked about these issues from my personal perspective, from my personal experience. I'm not a real expert in this respect, but from common sense, from my career experience, I understand the exchange issue has been really or wrongfully accelerated. The exchange, foreign exchange currency, or, or, the, or, or the currency exchange ratio must be developed, I mean, must be de decided by the market with the government governing. People would say Chinese government control the currencies. Is there any other country any, any government in the world does not hand on the currency control. You know, show me an example. Even an island country, they concern if they do have their own currency. They got to watch it. They got to monitor it. So China has been monitoring the exchange rate between other currencies, you know, maybe in other currencies, since mid 80s. And about uh, 87 or 88, we had the swap market, foreign exchange swap market established in Shanghai. That's the initiative. Um, on the, on the uh, uh, how to say, to, to get the knowledge and get the <coughs> feedback from the international currency market. Within, with the China's capability on export, China's currency will get you know, more value and, and uh, renminbi got to be uh, uh, increased the value, got to be. But how to do it? How to manage it to give a sustainable and stable market react? One thing really, or two things, really bothered the Chinese uh, uh, government. One is the hot money, okay? Second is the adapt, adapt uh, how to say that? The capability to digest by the industries. If you are in the trade, you know, none of the businessmen will pay for the difference of the currency exchange changes. Eventually, we're transferred into the end users, not necessarily industrial end users, but the consuming end users. Because every economy, the final payer are the consumers. If you think about it, it's not industrial users. It's the household users. So if you put, you know, you, you push Chinese currency increase, eventually 
every consumer will pay for that. It's not Ch Chinese government, it's not the business. Of course, if you increase too much, business could not adjust it. You don't give the time for the business to adjust it, and some of the business with very lean profitability will go bankrupt. They're going to be out of business. But for those business be capable for cash flow for six and a years, six months and a year time period, they can, they're going to have the time to transfer this expense, this increase into the consumers, to their final products. No matter how, directly, indirectly, eventually will be there. So now we witness, because six months already passed, almost a year already passed, what China's currency increase now has been reflect, reflected on the racks of the retails. Of course, it will help some of the balance of the bilateral trade. But it's just a matter of six months to a, a year. That's, 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 the, that's the relay, all the delay of the time. Why economics only depends on the figures they have seen. But they got to keep their, in their mind, all these figures reflect the fact six months ago. So when they make the decisions, when the decision implemented, it's just too late. And uh, so talking about the currency, yes, I believe, personally believe, Chinese rent may be, will be increasing. But how to maintain the economy stable and uh, keep it sustainable and leaves less chance for speculators and to give the benefit to the people, to the manufacturers, to the business communities, I believe LIBO plus one or two will be more safer. So it's about four or five percent in a year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you Mr. Fish and yes. art, it's called uh, uh, Art of Marbling. Thank you. People in China, people in the U.S. really dream the same. Better living, better world, a peaceful world. And uh, so I think, uh, you know, we, 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 we touched that. I'm so glad, that, you know, the questions are really, really uh, wonderful. And I enjoy it. And uh, talking about the currency issues, it's not a matter of a currency. It's a matter of a trade policy, I think. It's a matter of uh, the policy that how to encourage your exporters to work more resultful, more competitive with other competitors. I think the trade between U.S. and China is not only we compete to each other, but at the same time you compete with other economies. For instance, the first three months, China's total, invest, uh, total international trade is enjoying, I should say, enjoying a deficit. Even though it's a very limited amount, but it is a fundamental change. And it's kind of a reverse. And that's the target that China tried to, tried to fight for to balance its international trade. And if uh, China enjoy the deficit or the balance of international trade, why should, why should the U.S. and China got so much trade issues, got so much deficit on the U.S. side? So the deficit is not created by China. It's your U.S. yourself, because you lost the competition with other nations, with other economies, because others are performing much better. They enjoy the surplus. So the surplus is not on China's side, it's on other sides. 
Okay. So that deficit, you have to think to balance yourself and with more products to be export to China, to meet the China's needs. If the others can meet China's needs and can get the jobs from the U.S. and get the products to be exported to China and occupy the market share, which should be enjoyed equally by the U.S., that's your business. So it's not the currency because China's currency is open to others too, not only to the U.S. dollars, but also to your dollars, also to Japanese yen, also to Korean yen. If Korean, Japanese, Germany, French can enjoy surplus on the trade with China, why not U.S.?